Welcome to the final episode of Series 1 of Action for Animals. I've had such a wonderful time sharing the space with you. And Barbados, you know, is a really beautiful island with beautiful beaches, lovely locations and people. But here on Action for Animals, we have highlighted our other residents. Yes, the ones who depend on us for care and quality of life. I've had the pleasure of meeting and learning about some of these incredible animals and the dedicated individuals who seek to make their lives better. Like beekeeper Bethany Payne, who introduced us to the fascinating world of bees. Bees like the fact that they can have multiple sources of nectar and pollen. Okay. It's the same thing for human beings or other animals. So they travel far just for, um, just it, for variety? Sometimes they will. Okay. Up to five to eight miles they will travel. Okay. So what I'm going to show you is they're pretty good. Okay. So I'm actually going to take off this super and show you the brood box underneath. So this is. is where the queen normally lays her eggs. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This one is a bit more effective. Yeah, so okay. this is normally where the queen lays her eggs and where they rear all of the young larvae and the bees that are going to then continue the cycle of the colony. Okay. Just a pop of smoke. And for me as a beekeeper, as I said before, it's a very holistic experience. Yeah. So what I usually do is, um, ooh, one second. Top came off. So you're going very slowly in. Yes, I go very slowly because I want to make sure that I don't jar the bees by accident or make yeah. any sudden movements to make them a bit more agitated than necessary. And I also like to listen to the bees and observe their behavior because yeah. that is the way they actually communicate to each other and therefore I can understand what's happening inside the hive. So I look for any sudden changes in their mannerisms. Oh my goodness. Wow. So right here. Yeah. This is what we call a ball of bees. So you can actually, Amazing. Yeah. And I just noticed that they got a little agitated just now because I can actually smell the pheromones. We'll continue with this recap of season one of Action for Animals after the break. On Action for Animals, we've sought to, you know, highlight not only the proper care for the animals, but also, you know, how we can share the love to improve their quality of life, proper feeding, and what we get back in return is even more special. We had an opportunity to learn about cats, that's right, and that cat yoga, remember, with Karen Whitaker and Kaylin from the Ocean Acres Cat Outreach Program. Let's take a look at just what we learned. Lots of people love cats and they give excellent company and, and, and um, so many benefits and calming benefits to people. Um, and they're an easy pet to keep because you don't have to walk them and all of that kind of thing. So, so they're very, I mean, they are popular throughout the world, aren't they? Not just yes. in Barbados. So what we have in Barbados though is an overpopulation of cats, um, colonies of cats where they're not cared for, they're not particularly anybody's cats, so nobody's looking out for them, they're not necessarily getting fed or anything, there's issues with disease etc because when they're living in close quarters and they're undernourished and they're not fed their immune systems are deprived mm -hmm. so they're very prone to, to catch diseases. 
Um, and they can become a bit of a nuisance because they're going places that people don't necessarily think that they want them to go. So the whole thing is a bit of a, an issue for, for, the, for the public sometimes. So that's what we try to work with. Okay. Um, it's one of the things that we try to work with. Um, I noticed that you have a, a foster mm -hmm. um, here and I assume that Sugar is an example she is, um, yes. Of, of what you speak. Sugar gave herself up. <laughs> she gave herself up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did she do that? <laughs> well, a, a kind lady, I think, was doing her shopping and she spotted her and little Sugar just jumped straight into the lady's car. So um, she hadn't the heart because she likes cats. So she hadn't the heart to because she wasn't so well. Mm -hmm. So she, she took her home and she cared for her, but she couldn't keep her because she has some other dogs that were going to hurt her. Oh, okay. So that's how we got involved and, and Kaylin's taken her on to foster her until we can find her a home. So okay. she does need a home. She so does. what does it mean, Kaylin, to foster? Um, if you fall in love with them, you adopt or because I would imagine your home is full. That's always the hardship. Yeah, yeah. that's always the challenge is to, to let them go once they're healthy. But there's also such a great satisfaction in it because we have like sugar here. It's like animals don't, I mean, they can't really ask for help, but sometimes they can. So she quite literally asked for help. And so we, we took her on. She's about 10 weeks old, but she's much smaller than she should be because she's, she's had a rough start to life. Oh. And so fostering allows you to give them the love and attention that they need to, to be healthy. And then when you can find the right home for them and you know that they're going to have a good life and you were able to give them that life, right. it's really a special thing. And speaking about therapy, we learned about therapy or it should be animal assisted therapy. That's right. That was the way that it was, it was put animal assisted therapy and we learned all about the limbic brain and psychologist Philippa Williams who's certainly um, within that arena shared her knowledge with us. As mammals, so you know humans, dogs, horses, cats, etc, we all share the same part of the brain which is called the limbic system. Okay, yeah. and that is, I think you briefly mentioned it when you were telling Gail, but, but what's sure. this limbic system? So it's the oldest part of the brain um, responsible for your fight, flight, freeze. Um, and so we can actually connect to one another through the limbic brain. Uh, it's also responsible for the um, emotion center. I see. So if when I'm petting Max and Max is leaning into that, we are in a sense helping each other. That's correct. So mm. it doesn't matter which way around it might be of you who's stressed or distressed or whatever the emotion might be, um, if you're going to stroke Max, you will both level out and calm out and that's what's known as limbic resonance. Limbic resonance. I told you there's a science behind this. And Trudy actually was, I don't know, demonstrating to us earlier uh, what she does, not necessarily with cats, because Max seems to know Trudy very well, walked over to her, put his head there as if to say, okay, do what you do best, and Trudy started to massage him. So that's your connection then with the animals. It's quite interesting actually, because I only met Max today, but I love giving animals massages, and that's my whole connection with Ocean Acres. I went because I was under a lot of stress so I went to calm myself down and in doing so it led to somebody asking can I come with you because I'm going through a bad time and I ended up with a group of people all wanting to come so I was thinking what am I going to do with these people so I do a lot of yoga and I, I knew some people who were taught yoga and that's how Pause for Breath was born so really it was through the docks mm -hmm. and we were really just intending to do yoga, but the cats decided to join in. And then it sort of evolved from there because people found how therapeutic it was to do yoga and mindfulness with the cats joining in. And interestingly, um, the cat's personality has changed since, since we started to do it. Um, we've been doing it a year now. Um, the cats were very feral to begin with. They didn't like being stroked or picked up. They were very wary and now they love it. And later in the series, we continued with the 
therapy theme, this time with the horse charity, remembering that the word horse stands in this instance for the Humane Organization for the Relief of Suffering Equines. And we got an opportunity to see what horses do and how we care for them up close and personal right here on Action for Animals. Like any other animal, I mean, what we see in horses is a reflection of how they're treated. So I personally have never found horses that are inherently wicked. Um, I think they're lovely animals. They're, they're intelligent. They don't have a, a massive brain, but they learn commands. Research is um, identifying more and more how many words they can actually understand in our language. Um, we see it a lot in the training, in the communication. They, they're amazing to see with children especially and people that don't really know what they're doing. I, I have watched horses that if I got on the horse, for example, they might be a little bit um, challenging and maybe what we would say a little bit naughty. And then I have put children on them and led them around or the same horse has taught young children to ride on their own without ever putting a foot wrong. Um, they're, to me, they're, they're the best animal on the planet. Of course I, you would think so. <laughs> I, loved, I love all animals. I have a lot of rescued cats and dogs, and I'm always trying to save as many animals as I can, but horses definitely hold a special place in my heart. On Action for Animals Season 1, we were visited by some really adorable canines. There was Sniper, remember the Dutch Shepherd, who we learned um, was one of the best dogs when it came to taking instruction. How? Well, this is what we saw. Sniper is going to come. So notice that Sniper is being commanded um, in French. So Vinny means to come, Couchet means to go down. So you're going to now see Fous means heel to your side. So that is what you call a focus heel. So the dog is looking up at Trevor in his face while he walks. A pivot heel. Very focused, remember. Sniper is 15 months. Assy. Assy means to sit. Yes. And he gets a reward, which he loves to do, which is a retrieve, man. She'll come right back with that. Aus. Aus means out. <laughs> Very good. There were two adorable Jack Russells from the Woodbourne Boarding and Rescue Kennel. Remember them? What's their story? Well, um, they arrived at somebody's front gate and man I think this one managed to get under the gate. I would believe that. Uh, <laughs> and because the big, the big dogs um, didn't really like it. So mm -hmm. the lady came running out and opened the gate and she came in. Uh, but she phoned me and she said, Doran, I can't keep them. And I said, well, you know, do they belong to anybody? She said, I really don't know. But she said, can you take them in? So I said, well, Jack Russell's yes, we'll always take them in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Jacks that's how they precious. Came in. They're, yeah. they're very precious. Mm. But they're also victims of tail cropping. Um, you always see a Jack Russell in, in photos in the past with these little nubs for tails. My, my Jack, she's about seven, and unfortunately, as a puppy, when I got her, her tail was cropped. But I've noticed that that's no longer allowed. It isn't allowed. It's, it's against the rule, you know, it's against the law, really, to, to crop their tails or even their, their ears. You know, you can't, you can't sort of, um, keep 
all trained dogs personalities and that I mean tail is a is a great thing for them it's a rudder for them yeah it's a, because they're jumpers yeah but the reason that Jack Russells used to have their tails cropped was because of when they went down the foxholes and things like that they could just grab that knob of tail to pull them out that's, that that's not right I don't you know um, the, the problem here is that Jack Russells with the really short stubby bits They've obviously been done by a body and not by a vet. And who could forget the snake visit with Stacy Russell? Exotic animals, inclusive of snakes. You know, one of the things that we didn't talk about earlier on was the name Marizera. Oh. It's very uncommon. Tell me about that. Well, it's my daughter's name, my, both my daughter's name put together, Mariana and Nazira, okay. Marizera. Oh. Yes, Great. lots of persons do ask us about the name. That's so cute. Yes. <laughs> now let's go back to the serious business about dealing with these exotic creatures in Barbados. One of your messages, I think your loudest message is people should not be too quick to have a snake, for instance, as a pet. Yep. And yep. why is that so important for Barbadians to understand? Because having a, a, pet, a snake comes with high responsibility and for persons who know me I am very high with, um, very high on responsibility of having these exotic animals here in Barbados we don't want them to escape into the ecosystem so okay. if you're having if you're going to be having a snake we encourage persons to do your research about the animal before actually getting the animal okay okay because snakes are known as escape artists so if I had to give you a snake today and you had to take it home, within the next 24 hours, that snake will be looking to escape from the enclosure. It's a new enclosure and that snake will be looking to escape. So we don't want that. So before having this animal, you've got to make sure that you have a safe and a enclosure that this animal will not escape from it. Okay. Yes. Great. And we actually have two of your reptiles in the studio today. Yes. I am so curious so Stacey, and anxious to meet them. So before you actually meet them, I'm going to answer your question. Um, have you ever had COVID before? Well, actually, I, I haven't. Okay, well. Which, which has been a good thing. You're about to meet COVID. COVID. And we can't have COVID without having the pandemic. Wow. So you're going to have the pandemic. How does it feel, Stacey? It's an awesome feeling. He is so warm. I'm assuming that it's a he. Yes, they're both males. They're only two years of age. These guys were hatched during the, pandem during the COVID pandemic season. And that's why they gained the names COVID and pandemic. And how can you tell the gender of the snake? All right, it's quite easy for those persons who know what they're dealing with. All right, so male snakes have something called hemipenes, and this is actually found at the base of the tail, over this side. So, <laughs> to tell the gender, males carry two hemipenes, and if I had to press here and insert, you would actually see two, basically the penis. All okay. right? Yes. That's the way how we tell the gender. When we come back, those on the endangered list are not forgotten. The work of the Barbados Sea Turtle Project and their intrepid leader, Carla Daniel, is to say the least, amazing. What the work that they have done for conservation when it comes to turtles in Barbados is exemplary. And this is just an idea of why. Essentially, and this may be the first, one of the first times I'm I am disclosing this, our turtle population in Barbados is in decline. Oh. And it's something that we've only discovered in the last year or so. So the next few years are going to be critical. 
it is important for you to help because we cannot do it all alone. Mm -hmm. We are we have an amazing team of volunteers, but we're still just a few individuals. Turtles are nesting along our coastline. They're getting into trouble along our coastline. The species is still critically endangered. We have managed to pull our population back from the brink. We had about 50 nesting in uh, 1997, and you know we have more than quadrupled that now. Once again, we need all hands on deck if we're going to stop that population slide from going back down. So we're not sure exactly what the problem is, but there are many problems that we are aware of. And one of them is nesting females getting into difficulty, going into the road and so on, not having space to nest on our beaches because of our management of this shared resource. And we're not really sharing it. They're being ridiculously selfish when it comes to our beach chairs. I will happily call up the restaurants. They are being ridiculous as well because now everyone is doing this outdoor dining. So you have carpets tables and chairs taking up all of the space on the beach. Remember I said that Fitz Village was an oasis. Yes. There are many of these oases where there is the sand is there, the space is there, but there's no access granted to turtles because of what we are doing with the space. So that is one of the things that is going to be critically important moving forward, allowing turtles to have access to the remaining space. Climate change, we all know about that. The horizon is grim. We need to do the best with what we can. And one way that Barbadians can do that is by calling our 24-hour hotline 230-0142. I'll say it one more time, 230-0142. And our penultimate program was on another kind of animal, coral. It's important to us and our shorelines and the conservation work of Barbados Blue. It is the most peaceful time you will have for your day. For that 45 minute dive, it's the most, it's nobody can talk to you. Your phone can't ring. Nobody can want, anyone who wants your attention has to wait. You can't hear anything but bubbles. You can't, the fish don't talk to you. They just come, they say hi, they leave. <laughs> Turtles pass, they leave. I mean, it's the most peaceful time you will have, just underwater, in Barbados Sea especially. And it's clear. And it's clear. Most All days, right. very clear. And the coral, mm -hmm. what, what does it look like up close? It's, it's, I remember when I was younger, it was beautiful. Like, I'm not old, I'm, I'm 25, I'm not that old, but I remember when I started, the difference from then to the difference now is drastic in terms of the things you see. You used to go out there every day and know, okay, I might see a barracuda. I might see this, I might see that. And now it's not so sure, because oh. I mean, humans have, Barbadians like their fish. So a lot of them have been killed or whatever, but the coral, obviously over the years, global impact, some have died, but the beauty is still there. I think that last week when I was talking about coral and the coral reefs, I might have said that coral takes a million years to form. Of course, I was speaking about the reef structure, reef system. So forgive me for that little faux pas, but there's so many people to thank in this series. There have been 17 episodes of Action for Animals, and we would love to be able to highlight them all, but unfortunately, time does not allow. So I would like to thank, first and foremost, Gail Hunt and Action for Animals Barbados, its trustees, directors, and staff. Gail has been out there in the field. She's been chatting with some of the resource persons for us and she's been coordinating the varying interviews and subjects. So Gail, thank you so much. And we'd also like to thank the resource people, those organizations and individuals who give of their time and their experience to share that knowledge with us right here on Action for Animals. We can't forget Joel Bowen, our outside cameraman, and he was there in the thick of it with all of the animals, both here on land and on sea. And I'd also like to thank you, our viewers, for joining us every week and dropping me a note sometimes to let me know what you thought and what animals perhaps we should talk about next time. So I thank you for that. Thank you for your commitment. And to my director and crew, 
here on Action for Animals. Many thanks. We had fun here in this studio and we certainly hope it resonated with you in your homes or wherever you're watching us. I'm Peter Aline and I'm saying thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe and God willing, see you in season two.